Hi everyone, Mo Beliveau. Thanks for joining us with Drop the Mic, the Chamber podcast. This is where I get to chat with our members, local business people, thought leaders, business people in general, and get to know who they are, what they do, but most importantly, why they do it. I also wanna take a moment to thank East Hampton Media. Um, they are our partners within this project and Jen Ramsey and her team um, help us make it pretty spectacular. So thank you to East Hampton Media. And I would like to welcome today our guest, Matt Tarlecki of Abandoned Building Re owner. How's it going, Matt? It's doing very good, Mo. Yeah, today's off to a good kick and start. Yeah, we got our batch of beer mashed in and the day's rolling ahead. Nice, nice. So like I said, these conversations that we have been having here on the podcast are about, you know, who you are, what you do and why you do it. But we are still taping and filming uh, during COVID. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for now a year. Um, so part of our conversation will include um, how that's affected you and your business and that sort of thing. But before we get to that, let's uh, get to know you a little bit better, Matt. Tell sure. us a little bit of your background. You know, I, I, I in my research, um, I, I understand that you are not a native to East Hampton and uh, your profession prior to this. Yeah, I've, um, sorry, um, I've lived in a lot of different places before I ended up settling here in East Hampton. Um, I grew up outside of Philadelphia and uh, the suburbs out there in a town called Phoenixville. Um, went to college, uh, undergraduate out in California in a town called San Luis Obispo at Cal Poly. That's where I did five years of undergrad work for civil engineering and sort of where I got my hands wet in the beer uh, world out there. Um, you know, kind of a lot of, the, a lot of the beer trends kind of start out in California and moved the way out here. So being out in California in 2003 to 2009 was kind of when, um, you know, West Coast IPA craft beer craze was really big. So of course there was a homebrew shop in the town we lived in and uh, got to make some homebrew, you know, when I was 19. <laughs> that was always kind of fun. Right. Um, but uh, after the um, five years out there, I did a year of grad school work up in um, Ithaca, New York. Um, that was just a one year program, kind of intensive, uh, intensive lab work and classwork um, geared towards people who wanted to get out and work in industry. So it was a civil engineering degree um, for people who wanted to do work versus doing research. Um, after that, I ended up back in my parents' um, town um, working for a small firm um, in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, doing consulting work. Uh, general civil engineering stuff. So highways, dams, bridges. Um, and at the time we were working with PennDOT, no, not PennDOT, um, uh, some of the larger railway industries. So I got to really experience some, some, some big civil works projects and got to see how a lot of, um, you know, things got done uh, in, in the real world. Um, so while this was all going on, doing my nine to five job. I was uh, doing home brewing all the time on the weekends. There was a real big home brew um, sort of community in the Philadelphia area. There's always competitions every year. So I was always entering competitions and getting feedback and winning awards and learning. You've won awards. Yeah. Um, so right. it's always nice to kind of win, win some awards when you're home brewing. So there was three to five competitions a year. Um, and different homebrew shops had their own homebrew clubs. So, you know, when you won an award for your club, your club got points. And then the club with the most points ends of the year, you know, won a trophy. So, um, you know, I was brewing for 
th uh, three years in that in that area. Um, you know, I got a box of awards somewhere in my basement. Um, uh, a couple of golds, a couple of silvers. Um, some of those recipes did make it to what we do now. Also, um, yeah, yeah, that's pretty. Nice. Cool. So some of these recipes that I've been brewing have been going on for, you know, um, ten years now. Um, so we've had a lot of time to really tinker and kind of tweak these uh, recipes to kind of get them the way that we like the way they taste now. Um, so I guess get back to how I got back to East Hampton. Uh, um, going back to those homebrew, homebrew days, um, I was always making beer and then bringing them to friends' parties or music concerts in people's houses in Philly. You know, setting up a bar, selling homebrew on the side. People were really liking the stuff we was making, um, and then did that same kind of thing up here with some friends up here in the valley that I went to high school with that went to college up here, um, visited this area a lot in the summertime and the wintertime. And at, this was back in 2000 and, um, 10, 2011, uh, kind of when like the only craft breweries up here were lefties, BBC, yep. uh, Northampton brew pub, Amherst brew pub, um, I'm sure I'm missing a couple others, but those were sort of the big ones in the area at the time. Great. Um, and in the Philly area, like the craft beer scene really was exploding and it really hadn't hit up here yet. So my friends convinced me to think about moving up here to start a brewery. Uh, and I was like, ah, you guys are crazy. It's never gonna happen, it's too much work, you know? And after about a year or so of planning and looking for spaces, I ended up uh, giving my two weeks notice to the engineering firm um, and moved up here. Um, that was in February of 2013. So. I remember, because I started with the chamber in 2014, and uh, I remember having a conversation, I believe it was Will Bundy. Was it Will Bundy? Yeah. It was. So conversation with Will Bundy and he's like yeah and he goes and we're working on this the back building and abandoned building brewery and he was going on and on and on about you and I was like Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Dumb. Well, I had I had looked so I was looking for mill space and I talked to Will first um, and then I talked to um, our landlord um, uh, Jim Whitmer and yep. um, the space that Jim had was just bigger than what um, but Will had, right. when I've talked to brewers in the industry, they're like, get more space than you think you need because you'll grow out of it quick. So that's what we ended up over here at 142 Pleasant Street. Yep. Um, you know, we're, we, we say established 2013. Um, that's when we moved in here and established the, um, the company. Yep. But we didn't actually start making or release our first beer till uh, March of 2014. So that full year was construction. Right, right a full-time gig for me for that one year. Nice. And so there's, contrary to what many people might presume uh, regarding your name, there's another reason why you've named, you chose the name Abandoned Building Brewery, isn't there? So I actually, the name, um, I'm not sure if this is what you're speaking of. I had the name chosen out way before I ever moved up here. Yeah. So uh, it was when I was uh, living in Ith Ithaca um, and homebrewing there too. Like the house next to us was busted up and abandoned. Um, so that's kind of where the name Abandoned Building Brewery came from. And uh, I kind of carried that through like my homebrew years. I have some old business cards I made up for myself back when it was just me uh, brewing in a basement and uh, wanted to stick with that name. So I was trying to find a facility that kind of worked with that name right, and right. mill buildings were, were great for that. So you have a great space, but tell me why East Hampton? So it kind of comes back to the group. Other of, than your friends, you had friends here. I mean, there's a right. bigger picture. You don't just, just because. Right. So, you know, they were living in Belchertown at the time and then eventually moved to Hadley. Um, and I ended up moving in with them. That was my kind of in in the area. So um, I had visited here, uh, you know, a dozen times before. Um, but when it comes to 
uh, you know, came to the brewery, I actually had considered putting it on in, in a garage in their farm in Hadley and kind of like went down that rabbit hole and found out that the town wasn't going to be super into that. So kind of pulled back a little bit and we started looking at larger mill spaces. Um, did some research about East Hampton and found out that their water quality was really ideal for the kind of beers we were going to make. So that was a big plus. Um, and then it came down to things like uh, community and infrastructure. So the bike path right behind our location, right. uh, the proximity to you know the bustling Northampton and Amherst and East Hampton zones. And also uh, at the time, our landlord was like, you know, if you hang around here for a little bit, a lot of change is going to happen to the mills in East Hampton regards to infrastructure and improvements and accessibility. So we took all those things and, and decided that this is really a good place to be um, when you consider all the things that help a brewery succeed. Um, accessibility, location to community, um, you know, we don't have the highest visibility, uh, but people know about us now. People know. <laughs> people know. So this was, so this was a, you know, it wasn't, um, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't like you just had this, you woke up one morning and had this epiphany that it was kind of like a slow burn, falling in love. It wasn't like a eureka. Was it? Right, right, right. Now, at the time, they like said I'd been homebrewing for, I don't know, six or seven years. You know, I was getting my hands wet in that. I had done a little bit of volunteer work at a brew pub outside of Philadelphia also. Uh, and it was just a really, I don't know, I had really fun times hanging out with brewers and going to beer festivals and meeting people and trying new things. Um, but at the time, I had like a very comfortable, safe career as an engineer also. Um, it wasn't there. It wasn't like there was a shortage of work. The business or the company was steady paycheck. <laughs> uh, there was that. Um, you know, they were. Uh, I think a thousand employee company all over the U.S. Um, you know, travel. They had offices that they were opening up in like Dubai in the Middle East, um, doing some fun work with that. So I could have done a, a lot of different things than ending up in East Hampton. Um, but at the same time, I was like 23 ish and I was like, I didn't have uh, a family. So if I was going to make a big move, the easy time to do it was going to be then. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So working on a business plan and all those kind of things. Uh, it was like a, yeah, a slow burn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is it your passion? Oh, yeah. I love it. Uh, they, you know, they say you uh, never work a day in your life and you love what you do. So uh, there's a couple of, you know, sometimes it's, uh, there's some hard things to do, but every day is a fun day here. Um, we always are looking to improve what we do, always trying to learn new things. Uh, it's kind of the great thing about a craft. You, you know, you rarely ever get to be completely satisfied with what you do. So you're always striving to do something better. Right, right. And, and you have a solid team around you, do you not? I do. I do. Yeah, tell me about them. So when it started, it was myself um, and a group of friends. Um, eventually, when we finally opened up, it was still myself and my girlfriend at the time. Um, we were the like number two, uh, the two employees we had. And then eventually things kind of grew, uh, brought on an assistant brewer, brought in some more tap room people. And um, before... So I, so February of 2020, um, there were, it was myself, uh, an assistant brewer, um, another kind of um, brewery assistant that did some odds and stuff, um, two, two sales and delivery people, and then a group of about 13 taproom staff, which is about 20 of us. Um, and you know, during the peak summer times, we were all working on events and making beer and selling beer. So you learn quickly as a um, business owner that you want to do everything yourself, but you, if you want to grow, you have to delegate things out to people who can do them for you. Absolutely. And we're going to get to 2020 in a, in a moment. 
but it leads me to my next question is, you know, you're no stranger to having to, um, I don't want to say reinvent, but add on, invent, add value, that sort of thing. And because of, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but because of your lower visibility, you know, you came up with the Food Truck Friday. And that has been, feels like a slam dunk for you in good, you know, barring 2020, but. Oh yeah. You know, and tell us, so tell us about like that, like that, like how did you get to that? Like you, like we just like, like pacing back and forth in the brewery between your tanks going, we need to do a little something else here. <laughs> so one of the great things about the brewing industry is, is that it's all over the place. So whenever I was traveling with my wife, we would usually end up at a city that had at least a few breweries in it. So um, I got this idea from visiting um, uh, her hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, and saw a place that was doing this. You know, they had they had like 20 food trucks and thousands of people. And I was like, this is an awesome idea. Why can't we do this here? So um, at the time, it was early on in the years. Uh, it was a smaller staff, and we kind of cobbled together, um, you know, the starting of it wasn't even called Food Truck Friday yet because it just happened on days we could do it. So uh, there wasn't a set schedule yet. We had a, and, it, and the great thing too is that there was food trucks in the valley that were starting to come up. Um, earlier ones, Bistro Bus, Holy Ocumis, uh I'm sure there's a few other, but those are the first two we started working with. Mother Gourmet, I think was one of them also. Yeah, um, yeah. So this idea just kind of started in a summer to, in a summer and it kept snowballing and snowballing and it kind of comes back to that whole community aspect of why we located here. And you know that that idea works because people want to come out and enjoy themselves. Right. And, and it's no time. small feat. That's no small feat. You know, you, <laughs> you plan you plan out the whole summer and there's you know, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to call up some trucks and have people could come, you know, stop in. There's regulations that you need to follow. You know, you had to jump through some hurdles to um, comply with licensing mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff, because I don't know that people really understand, you know, licensing, right? So you have a license for your space and to be outside yes. of your parking lot, it's a whole other story. And there's, is. you know, transporting your beer from one place to another, which I think is interesting too, because as a brewer, you are, are you not a, can you, you transport, right? Oh uh, yeah. We have licenses to transport. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, usually, it's a big deal. Yeah. Usually what uh, every about January, February, we send out the schedule for food trucks to book up for the rest of the year. So our schedule is usually set by March for the next um, seven to eight months. Right. Um, so there's a lot of planning that goes involved. People want to be at the food truck Fridays. Um, yeah, they do. And that also we have to juggle the other events that we do throughout the year. Right, right. And um, what was I going to say about that? It's also made it into the, um, which I'm a part of um, as my seat on the chamber for the Regional Tourism Council. So Hampshire County Tourism. We have a, our own tourism guide yes. and it's yep. regular event featured in there. So that's oh, yeah. pretty cool. Um, yeah, so, and so now um, you also uh, have expanded your space, right? Yes. And you also had, before COVID hit, you had some plans to do some outdoor, regular outdoor seating. Yeah, so. so uh, let's get into 2020 see. and all of that. 2020, sure. Yeah. So 2020 is rolling around just fine in January, February, for the most part. Um, we have events booked for wedding rehearsal dinners and private birthday parties, um, beer dinners, things like that. So we had just been a year in our brand new space, which I'm in now. Uh, uh, it's sort of an extension of our original tap room uh, in that it's uh, a functional, functional tap room and brewing space. Um, increased our total capacity to about 250 people between both spaces. So this worked great for, um, you know, winter fest. We used to work, we would have live music here. I think, I forget what it was called. There's some catchy fun term we used to call 
drinking at Winterfest, or I don't know what it was. <laughs> something like that. It's catchy for me. <laughs> catchy for you, right? Um, uh, we so it was just a great venue to do public and private events, yeah. um, and twenty you know March hit and uh, it's been empty since. So we have had to do all of our outdoor seating, or we, we started outdoor seating in July of last year. Um, it was something that didn't work amazing for us because we had a dedicated outdoor space. We'd had to do it in, a, in the parking lot in the front of our building. Um, you know, we, you know, in the end, it was great to do it because it was able to keep our staff rolling um, and keep, um, you know, people having uh, a safe and good time as, as much as they could. Right. Um, we're looking forward to this year to bringing back some of the things we were doing before or starting something different also. Yep, yep. But you did, um, I, and, and then I wanna get into your why a little bit deeper, but, and you did start a new uh, bottle club. So you have your your mug club, you have the bottle club, and that I feel like you, you just launched that during, was like a new kind of, I hate this word pivot, but this new, added thing that you're doing yeah so uh we we you know we have been doing a mug club uh you know membership for a long time uh five years and uh that just wasn't going to work this year we couldn't really you know a lot of the perks of the mug club were being able to come and drink the beer the special release in the tap room so we kind of flipped and decided that we have a lot of beer that's barrel aging or special releases that we can put into bottles and get to people uh, so they can enjoy in their own homes. Um, so we just had our first release last week, big success. Um, and we're gonna be doing 11 more throughout the year. So we're happy for all uh, of the 60 members that joined up for that. Nice. So, you know, despite all of the, you know, the ups and the downs, and it, and it feels like to me, Matt, it, you are a, a positive person at heart, right? So, you know, you're going to figure it out one way or the other as an engineer, right? And yeah. um, but I want to know, like, what is it that owning your own business, owning your own brew company, you know, you've got distribution. I don't even know how far your distri distribution goes as uh, far as, state. right? And so, and how does that even work? But anyway, um, you know, what is it that, you just get so excited about when you wake up in the morning. Like, is there, you don't have mornings where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Everyone has those mornings. Yeah, but. But yeah, I, I, I see your question. Um, I, I think it does go back to sort of, you know, the decisions that I made for, to go out to California for school, uh, the engineering background, sort of uh, living on my own um, and far away from home early, that it's a kind of a combination of, you know, just also being an engineer, I think uh, having an optimistic outlook on things, uh, regardless of how bad the situation could be. Um, and sort of like a uh, dedication to hard work too. Um, when I made the decision to come up here, it was sort of like, well, it was the first time I had never clocked into a job before. So it's like, if I don't get this done, it's not going to get done at all. So sort of that motivation and drive to just like make the vision that I had in my head actually come out to reality mm -hmm. and then keep that going has been what gets me out of bed every day. So having that optimistic outlook on things, regardless of how bad it's, it looks, when things looked pretty bad in March. Um, but also knowing that there's, you know, people that rely on this business for careers too. So you can't give up on those people either. Um, right. so, so what better way to do it than make beer? Right. <laughs> right. Um, right. Things that most people enjoy. It's a, uh, challenge to make so it's not like it's easy to do um it may look like it is but there's a lot of things going on that uh people don't see to get the beer from a bag of malt to a can in your hand and um 
it's just really fun too. I really enjoy it. Uh, I, I would have gone this long if I didn't like what I was doing. What piece of, of your um, entrepreneurial journey do you, have you enjoyed the most? What gets you, like, like, like if you could do that one, is there just one or what, what's the? The one thing I enjoy the most? Yeah, besides drinking the product. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I feel like this is gonna sound really uh, nerdy and engineering, and engineering, but like figuring out the, um, figuring out all the red tape and how to, how to navigate it. Um, that was a really hard part. I never worked with local businesses before. Um, but working with East Hampton ended up being pretty simple for the most part. Um, you know, doing your homework, doing your due diligence and, and reading and, and staying on top of things. Um, uh, knowing what's going to happen when you make a decision and knowing how that decision is going to change the next 10 decisions you're going to make. Uh, knowing those kind of things um, were helpful then and they're helpful now too. Mm -hmm. If I was going to go and do it again, um, you know, I could probably open up a brewery somewhere else if I wanted to now that I've done it once. Um, so every state is different, yep. but uh, having that in your, you know, you know, in your um, experience uh, is something that you never, you're never going to forget that kind of stuff. So during this past year, um, you know, how has that, how is that, how has this whole COVID thing affected you, Matt Tarlecki? And then obviously we can, we know how it, it, it affected your business. You know, it's grinds things to a halt, right? What is it all I, meant to you? What is it all meant to you? So, you know, the things that work great about breweries in Massachusetts is the flexibility we have with the licenses the state gives us. So being able to brew and then serve those beers on premise, um, you know, breweries open up because that is their main source of revenue or the only source of revenue. Um, one thing about us is we're, a, a, you know, a, a, a smaller, but we're still a production brewery. So we had distribution already uh, in existence. So when the tap room and on-premise um, revenue stream was completely cut off, you have to kind of go back and think, well, what's worked for us so far? Because um, there's so, only so many things you can do to start new in a time like this. So we had to kind of regroup and figure out what's worked. Well, distribution works uh, and um, people still know where we are. So this idea of curbside pickup, you know, started in, and eventually became uh, a crucial part of our business. Mm -hmm. uh, to this day, we still are doing curbside pickup um, and our distribution side of things. So we've had to, like I said, change a lot of the way we get the beer to people. We haven't changed how we make the beer. Um, that has still stayed the same. Uh, as far as how it's changed um, for me, uh, I think this goes for all of our staff too. We just don't get that uh, customer interaction anymore that we used to so much. So, you know, we get to do newsletters and live Instagram feeds and, and things like this, but um, you know, we don't have that, the beer festivals anymore. You know, that's one of the main reasons we people get into making beers to see people enjoying it and have the interaction with customers. So um, it's been really hard to have limited amount of interactions with people um, uh, for me and I'm sure everyone else. Right. Yeah. I, for me, I mean, I'm such a people person. It's like, oh my word. Um, that was been a tough one. So what yes. do you think your biggest lesson has been within the last 12 months? Oh, uh, being flexible. Um, if you get into being rigid and thinking things can only be done one way. And if that one way gets taken away from you and you don't, have a way to change, you're going to be in a tough spot. So um, I think being flexible and um, behind that, having a really um, great team that can help you change the way things have been done in the past. What is, um, one, of, what is one of the hardest changes that you've had to make in your life? 
because of COVID or just in general? Um, that is a good question. Well, it's, it seems like it's been, it's been going on for so, oh, so, I've been doing this for so long now. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, when you're a business owner that does a lot of events, you end up doing a lot of things too. So I end up spending maybe a little more time than I would like uh, and my wife would like me to spend here at work sometimes. Um, uh, coming back to that, um, now that we're not doing any events here at all degree anymore, um, I am spending less time here now, um, which is nice. Mm -hmm. but, uh, sorry, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> what was the hardest change you've had to make in your life? Hardest change, right, right. Um, that's a good question. I guess just, um, setting something up where uh, it's hard to sort of walk away from it now. So now that I've got this thing going here, I got to make sure it, it, you know, it succeeds and, and keeps growing. So I forget who said it. I think I heard someone say this, that if your business isn't uh, growing, it's uh, shrinking. Mm -hmm. so we always are trying to head in, that, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have so much of your heart and soul. And I mean that literally in that space and in that in that business and in your community right right i mean even though i'm the um the um the, the brewer here you know like i said we have a huge team that helps get things done um but at the end of the day it's still uh you know it's definitely a, a labor of love uh here well matt um as we're going to close out our chat, is there anything that you want our viewers to know about you that they may not know? That they may not know. Mm. Um, you know, it's a, it could be a misconception um, that people have. Uh, we don't drink all the time here at work. <laughs> uh, even though we uh, do a lot of sampling and testing, you know, at least here at Abandoned Building, you know, we don't come in at uh, 10 in the morning and start off with a pint of beer in the day. So. <laughs> Right. Uh, usually if we're having our, uh, you know, we're having our shift drink, that's at the end of the day. So <laughs> that's one. Awesome. Well, Matt, I want to thank you for taking time to chat with me today. It's always sure. a delight to chat with you and to work with you. And I want to also thank you for being such a strong chamber supporter. And um, especially, you know, during 2020 and renewing your membership, that it means a lot to us because we know that, you know, hard decisions um, are probably going to have to be made. And so um, yeah. I, I want to thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. And, um, and where can people find you since they can't come into your space? Where can they That's get your, your, your product? Where can they find you? Where can they get more ABV? Great question. So um, uh, we our online store is um, found at our website, abandonedbuildingbrewery.com. You can order beer for curbside pickup there. Uh, right now it's Wednesday through Sunday. We're also doing home delivery too on the weekends. Um, to, That's new. Yeah, uh, we've been doing that since about uh, Thanksgiving now. Uh, right. Yeah, so uh, most places in the Valley um, and at any of your local favorite package stores, beer stores, grocery stores. Um, and if we're not at your favorite place, give us a call, let us know and we'll get it there. Neat. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me. I want to thank our viewers and listeners for joining us again for Drop the Mic Chamber podcast. Thank you, Jen Ramsey and East Hampton Media for making us always sound and look swell. And if you'd like to know more about the Chamber of Commerce, you can find us at easthamptonchamber.oops.org. And um, yeah, until next time. Thanks for having us.